Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us tonight for our live stream all about owls. My name is Nicole McSweeney, and I'm Mass Wildlife's Outreach and Marketing Manager. With Halloween just a few days away, it's the perfect time to highlight these mysterious creatures. Joining me tonight is Andrew Vitz, Mass Wildlife's ornithologist. Drew's focus is on conserving all the birds in Massachusetts, both common and rare. That's a really big task. So thankfully, we have the help of a lot of partners, including two that are here with us today, Mark and Marsha Wilson. Marsha and Mark have both had a passion for birds since childhood. Through Mark's wildlife photography and books and their live owl programs, they foster a curiosity about all wildlife to people of all ages. More than half a million people have enjoyed their Eyes on Owl program in schools and public events over the last 26 years. And on screen here is one of the books Mark has written about owls. So we're in great hands and beyond fortunate to have these owl experts here with us tonight to teach us all something new about owls. Mark and Marsha will be showing us some of the live owls in their care throughout the night tonight. And we want this to be fun, interactive, and informative. So please send us any questions you have in the chat and we'll try to answer them throughout the presentation or during our live Q&A session at the end. And with that, I will turn it over to Mark and Marsha to kick it off, tell us a little bit more about themselves and introduce us to our first owl. That's the call of our smallest owl here in New England. It's the Northern Sawwet Owl, which I have on my hand here. And we're gonna to try to get it to face the camera. We should have mounted a mouse above the camera to get its attention. <laughs> but the Sawwet Owl right now is migrating through Massachusetts. And at times, the Northern Sawwet Owl is probably the most common owl in the state, particularly during migration. But go out into the woods and try to find one. It's almost impossible to find these little owls. They're experts at hiding, and they're super cute, uh, but they're super hard to find. And that's because sawwet owls can be preyed on by barred owls and cooper's hawks, sharp-shinned hawks, and great horned owls. So they know how to hide to stay safe during the day. And then at night, they're primarily nocturnal, and they're out hunting. But the northern sawwet owl has driven many birders crazy trying to find it. It's one of the most difficult owls to locate because they're so good at hiding. Uh, but right now, last weeks of October, uh, the first weeks of November, we're seeing big numbers of them moving down out of the su Southern Canada in Northern New England. And they're coming through Massachusetts, headed South. Some of them may stay here for the winter. Others keep going down into the Appalachians where they probably winter, although Drew may uh, have more information about where they winter than I am aware of, but not a lot is known about their wintering areas um, because they're so hard to find. But it's the cutest owl by far. It's not the smallest owl in the United mm -hmm. States, however. That would fall to the elf owl, which is found out in the southwest in the desert. But these little owls are pretty lightweight. They weigh about three ounces. Um, but don't underestimate them. They're great hunters. They can take down insects like moths and a lot of small mammals like voles and mice and small birds too on occasion. Um, now, finding a sawwet owl is always tricky. You want to look for the thickest pines or spruce trees or cedar trees. And if you're lucky enough to spot one roosting in one of those trees and you're not too loud or too close, they'll usually just sit there and look at you. Uh, they're not usually going to leave the safety of that close cover. So they're often easy to observe once you find them, but finding them is really the difficult part. Um, it's also a lovely owl to photograph. And to identify it, you want to notice that the head has a rounded shape. It doesn't have ear tufts like a screech owl has. And, of course, it has yellow and black eyes, as do all the small owls in eastern U.S., out in Western US, there is a small owl that has dark eyes, but you won't see that here in Massachusetts. Uh, but the sawwet owl is a fierce little hunter, beautiful little owl, and it's one of my favorite owls, I have to say. And it's partly because, trying not to block Marsha's face yeah. there, uh, it's partly because they're so hard to find that you rarely see them in the wild. I mean, Drew, how many have you seen in the wild, not counting on a banding station? 
Oh man, just a handful. Um, yep, me I've too. Heard them a few times, but not often. As you said, they are, you know, they they kind of get reclusive. Um, and I've seen them a few times in the winter, particularly. A good thing to do to find them is, is if you have a, a little flock of chickadees and juncos or smaller birds that are agitated, you know, see what they're agitated about. It just might be a, a, a solid owl tucked into a pine tree or yeah, the chickadees uh, will mob them, them, won't they? Yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. So that's probably the best way to, to try to get, you know, to try to find one is to pay attention to what the small birds are doing. Um, but yeah, and, they uh, here in the landscape for sure. Learning the call, which is a toot, not a hoot, um, will help you hear them in, in the winter. Some of them do nest here in Massachusetts in small numbers. Uh, they're a cavity nesting owl, and they would nest in uh, usually cavities made by pileated woodpeckers uh, or maybe even some other the bigger woodpeckers um, like flicker or red belly woodpecker. Um, so if you see a small face peeking out of a cavity, it's either a sawwet owl or a screech owl. Um, both of those owls are cavity nesters. Um, now, in the winter, you won't see them in a cavity. You'll see them roosting in that thick vegetation, like the tree, spruce trees or the cedar trees that I mentioned. If they're in trouble, you know, if, if we get an icy crust, they may have trouble getting food in the winter. And you may find one down around the bushes around your foundation in your house or apartment. Um, and in that case, you would want to maybe have someone come out and try to capture the bird and get it to a rehabber where they can get the bird to gain weight and then be released back to the wild. Because sometimes these little guys on a tough winter do starve. They turn up underweight and they kind of lose energy and they just sit there low to the ground looking kind of not too healthy. Uh, but generally, if they're high up in a tree, you know, five, six, seven feet up, they're healthy, they're doing fine, and they'll just sit there and stare at you. So, Marsha, I think... Oh, actually, we're going to go into Drew's uh, explanation of sawwet banding. Uh, Drew has been banding sawwet owls the last yep. several nights, and you've had some good luck, haven't you? Yeah, it's been a good year. So, yeah, sawwet, like Mark and Marcia, sawwet owls are one of my favorite owls in, in the state. Uh, something about a diminutive predator, um, it's just different. It's pre They're pretty awesome. And, you know, they're, they're about 80 grams. So that's about the same size as a blue jay. So they really are pretty small. Smallest, as Mark said, the smallest owl we have in Eastern North America. There are several smaller species in Western North America, even half the size of a solid. So the elf owl is only like 40 grams. Um, they're, they're pretty awesome too. Um, but these solids are great. Uh, they, they are nesters in Massachusetts. They're, they're kind of found throughout the state as a nester, but seldomly found. Um, you really have to look hard for them. And, but, but they are increasing. The, the, the breeding bird atlas that Mass Audubon has done over the last uh, number of decades has shown that, that they do seem to be increasing. So that's good news. Um, and when we get them most is during migration. So right now, peaks are right about Halloween, which is perfect um, for, for owls. And so, so they are migrating through our state. They, they fluctuate year to year in, in the numbers that, that, that we get them coming through in, in the fall. And largely due to the number of, of young they were able to produce. So they kind of operate on a boom and bust life cycle where if their prey are super abundant, um, the, the small rodents, the mice and voles, they will produce a lot of young. And, and if the, the food resources just aren't there, they don't produce very many young. So last year, not many young came through. Um, banding stations from over, throughout the country had, had low numbers. This year, the exact opposite, huge numbers of birds coming through. Some of the bigger stations have caught over 100 birds in a night. Um, some, some along coastal Maine get, get numbers like that. I am actually a, a, an owl bander. I just kind of do it um, a, a few hours a night as I can fit it in. And I just do it behind my house. So I'm appreciative of my neighbors who seem to put up with me and uh, the, the call because we have to play a call to attract the birds and, and it can be loud at times. Um, but we've had great luck this year. I'm on, we're on a record year. We've had over 80 birds uh, just in the last couple of weeks, um, about 15 birds a night last weekend. So I think this next weekend will be will be kind of the peak as this cold front moves in, and then it's going to decline after that. And some of the birds do stick around all winter, so they'll be a, they'll be in mass all, all winter long. Um, but most of them are moving into the mid Atlantic or maybe even a little bit farther south. Um, so this is a great time to get out. 
again, look for those small, smaller birds that, that seem agitated and, and you might just find a silhouette owl. Um, here are some images of, of uh, banding the silhouette. So in the upper left, and, and Mark actually took these, he came out the other night. Uh, the upper left is a bird in a net. And I, and I will say that to ban silhouette owls, you do have to be a licensed bird bander. Um, you have to have federal and state permits to do that. So I certainly have those permits. Um, even to buy the nets, you're supposed to have the permits and to get the birds, you, you need the permits as well. So with that, in, in the top left picture there, you can see a, a bird in a net um, just kind of hanging there, uh, waiting to get extracted. I check them every half an hour at least. So they don't hang there long. Um, probably, you know, most of them no longer than 10 minutes. Come out, pull them out of the net and, and bring them into the house for, for processing and banding. Um, the nets are made specifically to capture birds. It's a very safe way to do it. Um, it it's a very good tool to, to trap birds. And they make them in all different sizes for different sizes of birds. You can see a bunch of different pictures of, of saw wets. The top one is uh, of me getting the band on, the top middle uh, band on the leg. Um, and and on, the, on the right, he's being taken back outside and ready to release. The whole process, once you have him out of the net, only takes 10 or 15 minutes. Um, before you're getting them ready to, to get back out there. So it, it's a quick process. We collect a lot of data. And Nicole, we can go to the next slide. It's actually part, so, so I'm not, you know, the only owl bander out there. There are lots of these. Um, we have at least seven or eight in Massachusetts, and, and there may be more. Um, and, and we all put data into a project called Project OwlNet, which was started in 1994 by a state biologist in Maryland, David Brinker. Um, and it was really to facilitate communication and coordination among these banders uh, to standardize methods. Um, and, and so owls are, are banded, their data collected includes their age. So the picture in the top right, you can see how that owl's wing is fluorescing a pink coloration. Um, that's a result of the, a pigment called porphyrins that owls have. Not many birds have porphyrin pigments, owls are one of them. And they fluoresce when they're uh, when the, when you use a black a UV light or a black light um, shining on the feathers. And the newer feathers fluoresce pink, and the older feathers lose that pigment and don't fluoresce anything. Um, so on a on a hatching year bird or a bird that was hatched out this summer, they're all new feathers on that bird. No, no the older birds have feathers that are one or two years old. Um, so all the feathers are fluorescing pink. It's an easy way to age the birds. You don't need the the UV light to age them but it's kind of fun and it's an easy way to do it. If you saw a mix of white and pink feathers, you could age it as an adult. Um, here you can see I'm taking the wing cord in the, in the middle photo and then, and then collecting his mass in, in the bottom photo. But these data are really important. When we get information on the age of them, we, we get an idea of how, how many young they produced this, this last year. Um, and, and just the total numbers being tracked is a good way to, to uh, gauge the, the population trends. And all these data, as I said, go into a centralized database. So in a nutshell, that's kind of uh, the owl banding project that, that gets, uh, this is, uh, there's, uh, there's over 100 uh, owl banders throughout the country. So, so it, it, it gets to be a big data set. We, we're, we're learning a lot about northern solid owls this way, where we almost knew nothing before, before this project started. So Marsha uh, has brought in two screech owls to compare to the sawwet owl. Now here in Massachusetts, screech owls come in, eastern screech owls come in two colors. Oops, there you go. And Marsha has both colors on her hand. She has the rusty brown or red one there in the, in the center. And then off to this, to the other side is the gray one. And you notice they are bigger than a sawwet owl. And they also have ear tufts, whereas a sawwet owl does not. So even if you only see these owls in silhouette in the evening light, you can tell a sawwet from a screech owl pretty easily just by its silhouette. Screech owls have a poor name. They don't really screech. They have more of a little tremolo or a little whinny. And the hotshot birders that can do the uh, the whistle, the tremolo or the whinny uh, can often draw in other birds that will come in to try to mob the so-called owl that they're imitating. And so um, you might have a birder uh, whistle a screech owl call, and then suddenly all these wobblers and chickadees and titmice and nuthatches show up. And they're all concerned that there's a screech owl in the neighborhood, which potentially could eat them. So um, that's one of the tricks that birders use. But screech owls are probably, 
in southeastern Massachusetts anyway, the most common owl. Uh, they're all over Cape Cod, and they like habitats of mixed woods. They need cavities to nest, so they need older woods. Or if you put up a birdhouse, you can encourage them to nest in your yard. And Marsha, what's the story behind these birds? Well, these birds were part of a, 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 a federal study on West Nile virus. They were trying to see if adults passed on immunity to their young. And so we went, we drove down to the bird banding lab in Patuxent, Maryland. Mm -hmm. And the, the experiment took three years and these birds were hatched in captivity uh, from adults that were inoculated. Right. And I think we haven't read the paper, but we believe that there was some immunity passed on to offspring that they discovered in the study. You know, when first when West Nile first appeared in this country, um, a lot of the raptors that were bitten by infected mosquitoes would die. We actually had a snowy owl that succumbed to West Nile virus. So now we net in all of our owls in cages with mosquito netting. And like Drew, we have to have permits to uh, have these birds to handle them. Right. We have both federal and state permits, and the state permits are from the wildlife agencies in each state that we go into. We go into five states and do programs, because in this country, it's it's not legal to have an owl as a pet, like it is in England, or India, or Japan. Right, and federally, we're licensed by U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, so it's and uh, Mass Wildlife and Mass Wildlife. Yeah. But the screech owls are, are heavier. They're five or six ounces. So they're they're quite a bit heavier than the sawwet owl. And they eat a lot of the same things. Although screech owls are known to occasionally take fish. Uh, they certainly take earthworms on occasion. Although you would never know that by looking at an owl pellet because the earthworm would be totally digested. Uh, some of you might have taken apart owl pellets in school in second, third, fourth, fifth grade. And you'll know that a owl pellet contains all the digested material from the previous meal. So that would be fur, skull, and bones. And so when you're out in the woods, you can look for pellets on the ground. And when you find them, it tells you that owls are in the neighborhood. The other, white, the other clue to look for is whitewash, which is a polite word for bird poop. And oftentimes owls will use the same roost several nights in a row, or days in a row, I should say. And uh, the whitewash can build up. So whitewash can be a good clue as to where the owls are hanging. If we, as we look at the back of the sawed owl's head, I just wanted to have you notice this two white spots on the back of the head. And those are thought to be to resemble false eyes. So some people think, researchers think that that helps this little owl keep predators at bay because a predator usually doesn't want to be seen coming in to grab its prey. It wants to come in uh, unseen. And they think that these spots on the back of the owl's head help the predator, uh, keep the predator at bay, I yeah, guess you would say. They're, they're eye spots a lot like the pygmy owls have, only not as defined. And pygmy owls are out west. Right. Um, but sawwet owls are found across the country and into Alaska and southern Canada. Um, in the boreal forest. So they're they're quite widespread and super cute. And I'm gonna tuck the sawwet owl back. Marsha, you can maybe tell us a little more about the screech owls. Okay, well, when I was growing up, my mother uh, acquired the state and federal permits to use live owls for educational programs. And her first birds were screech owls. And yes, they lived in the house, and they had free reign of the living room, but this was back in the 60s. And uh, it gave us a chance to really observe and learn about their behaviors. And one day my mother was sitting down to a, a bowl of vegetable soup. And sure enough, the red screech owl landed right in the middle of her bowl of soup. And she realized, oh, well, they need a, 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 something to bathe in. And so after that, she always offered them uh, a basin of water. So, but all of our owls love water. They either sit in the rain uh, in their aviaries or they, they all have fresh water available at all times. And they can sit in the sun or the shade. 
Uh, these two owls live together. They're both females. And how old are they? They're five years old. And in the wild, they probably live five, six, seven years. Uh, in captivity, they can live a lot longer. Uh, we had one screech owl that lived to be 18. Um, I know of one educator that has a screech owl that's in its, I think it's 26th or 27th year, which is incredibly long lived for a small owl. Unlike dogs, with owls, the big owls tend to live longer than the little owls. So unfortunately, the little owls are on the predator's uh, lunch menu. So they, these guys have to be careful uh, that they don't get caught by a Cooper's hawk or a larger owl. Yeah, um, since we're close up on the screen, I, I want you to notice the beautiful pencil streaking, especially on the back of the red screech owl. It's really something that would be hard to see in the wild. So it's a really handsome little bird. The gray one has it too. So your best way to find a screech owl is to pay attention to cavities and trees. So if you do a commute either on foot or by car to school or to work and you pass trees with holes in them, Check those holes every day as you go by, and sooner or later, you're going to get lucky and see one that has a screech owl sitting in it, perhaps on a winter day, sunning. And they love to sun in the winter. Um, they'll be just their eyes closed, sitting up in that cavity. And if you hang around towards dusk, those eyes will come open, and they'll get active, and they'll look around, and then you'll see them fly off. Now, but those ear tufts are not only we think used for camouflage and mood expression. But if you look at them from behind, they're concave. They kind of have this, this kind of shape. Right. And this hasn't been proven, but Bill Byrne, who was a staff photographer for Mass Wildlife, noticed that the rear side of these ear tufts are concave. And he was postulating that perhaps sound could be funneled from the back of that ear tuft down into the ear of the owl, which is right in behind the eye. So anybody out there looking for a PhD thesis, <laughs> jump on that, because we think that ear tufts can deflect Oops, sound sorry. from uh, the back into the ear. But yeah. that's a hypothesis at this point. It hasn't been proven. Um, that little chattering you're hearing is the gray screech owl complaining. That's not a call you're going to hear in the wild. The call you're probably going to hear sounds more like a little whinny. And Drew, I'm going to ask, put you on the spot. Do you know how to trill? Oh, uh, no, I'm not good at the owl call, so I'll let no, you guys. Yeah. Good at it. You're born with the ability. So. <laughs> a lot of birders can trill, and uh, that's a very useful skill. Yeah, I wish I could trill, but yeah. I can't. But you can um, you can go on allaboutbirds.org or Xenocanto, right, and listen to the different, uh, different calls. The right. Yeah. Um, now, some people use call playback to attract owls. That's a tricky thing. You don't want to be doing that um, during the nesting season because you're going to be stressing birds out. But in the fall, it's okay to do it judiciously. I wouldn't do it in the same spot night after night. And I just would do it for a minute or two to see if you get a response. Um, it's also illegal to do it in uh, national wildlife refuges and bird sanctuaries. So call playback, use it carefully. Don't use it when you're around a lot of people and uh, don't do it in the same locations over and over and over again. Um, but it does work and you can often get a response from an area that you'd never would see the owl otherwise. All right. Marsh is going to go get our next owl, which is probably the most common owl year round in Massachusetts. It's the barred owl and barred owls are actually expanding their range They've arrived out on onto Cape Cod in good numbers now. They're nesting on Cape Cod. 20 years ago, you wouldn't have found a barred owl nest out there. But now they're turning up, nesting, having young. Uh, the sightings of them as far out as Provincetown. Uh, in the rest of the state, they're doing very well. Uh, we have great habitat. They like mixed woods, hardwoods, and softwood mixed forest. Um, they're usually a cavity nester like the screech owls, uh, although occasionally a barred owl will use a stick nest or a squirrel's nest to nest in. Um, I have not seen that, but I've had reports of other people seeing that. And barred owls, it's B-A-R-R-E-D, not to be confused with barn owl, which we'll also show you here in a few minutes. 
But barn owls are probably one of the first owls I remember hearing when I was camping up in the White Mountains in New Hampshire. They have an eight note call. And if you put words to it, it kind of sounds like they're saying, who cooks for you? Who cooks for you all? And here's the barn owl. Look who we called in. <laughs> okay, I'm going to back up and give Masha some space here. I'm going to make, I'm gonna you, make guys you guys ice cream. cream. <laughs> <laughs> give, give the bird a chance to be on the screen. So this is a female barred owl. And in the world of owls, females are usually larger than males. And I'm going to get her. There she goes. Notice she has dark eyes, rounded head, yellow beak. And the bars are across the chest, upper chest. These are the bars for which he is named. So these are bars. These are stripes. So bars and stripes. And you can see that this barred owl has a drooping right wing. This bird was hit by a car. Uh, we, we're not sure how old this bird is, but it was hit by a car, what, three years ago? Mm -hmm. And brought into a rehabber. And she tried to get that wing to heal back to a normal position, but unfortunately it didn't. So this bird is unflighted, non-flighted, can't be released back to the wild. And so we give her a good handicap ramp to get up and down in the cage, outdoor cage. And she gets three or four mice a night for supper. She hasn't had her supper yet. So mm -hmm. after the program here, she'll be getting her three or four mice. Yeah, we have the mice thawing on the other side of the Yeah, room. we buy them frozen. They get shipped to us on dry ice. They come from a mouse farm out in Indiana. And these are free range vegan mice. So they're very healthy for the owls. And we don't feed mice that we would trap here in our yard or in the house because we never know if our neighbors have been using rodenticides. And if you feed a poison mouse to an owl, you're gonna end up poisoning the owl. So if you have a mouse in the house, we would ask you not to use chemical poisons to get rid of them, use a snap trap. It's much more efficient. It kills the animal very quickly. They don't suffer. And you don't end up poisoning foxes and coyotes and owls and hawks and any other animal that would eat a mouse. So rodenticides are bad news. This barred owl uh, we thought was a male until last year she laid an egg. So it shows you what we know, right? Yeah, and that was at a school pro program. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> much to the delight of some third graders, yeah, she I laid an egg. Opened up the carrying box and there was an egg. Yeah, and they have dark eyes. And I know some of you are asking, well, why are their eyes dark? There's another PhD thesis here for somebody. Owls have different eye colors and we don't know why. Uh, you know, they come in orange, yellow, dark brown, like the barred owl. And these different eye colors, you know, down through millions of years have stayed with the birds. And we're not sure why different species have different eye color. It's kind of like with humans. Why are some blue eyed and some dark eyed? You know, there's some theories that it depends on where the humans were um, from originally. So if you're from near the equator, possibly you had dark eyes. And if you're in northern climes, you have blue eyes. But that's, you know, that's still debatable. Um, and with owls, it doesn't seem to follow any pattern like that at all. So it's a, it's one of those un unanswered questions. We certainly don't know everything there is to know about owls. And do you want to guess how much this bird weighs? Do I hear a pound? Pounds too low. This bird's about a pound and a half. So most of the bulk you see there is feathers. Looks like it could be a five pounder, right? But no, this is only a pound and a half and a big female. She's, she's a relatively small female. A big female could go maybe two pounds. And if you hear screaming or weird sounds outside your bedroom window, chances are very good that it's a barred owl because they, mm -hmm. they can just really make some strange sounds. And sometimes in the spring and summer, they can do what's called caterwauling. It's <laughs> cacophony like, of owls. Yeah, it sounds like the lunatics are out there. And a lot of people think they're hearing a screech owl when they're actually hearing a barred owl screech. So screech owls don't screech, barred owls do. And also, um, barred owls sometimes just do a short call. They do a you all. <laughs> they don't always do the eight notes. So... And they have a lot of variations. 
all. Yeah. And if you hear something sounding like a murder going on in the woods, <laughs> it's probably a barred owl. It's not probably a fisher. A lot of people think they're hearing fishers when in fact they're hearing barred owls. In fact, I have never heard a fisher, but I've heard hundreds of barred owls. Uh, some of them screaming and some of them sounding like there's a murder in the woods. So very appropriate for Halloween if you want to be scared of a sound that comes out of an owl's beak. And Mark, can you tell us about when the young come out of the, the nest cavity? What happens then? Well, they, they'll they jump and try to fly and then they'll crash under the ground and they can't fly well yet. So they climb trees very well. They, they flap climb trees. They use their strong feet their talons to climb up pine trees and they'll flap their way up the tree. I saw one baby climb a pine tree 60 feet in a matter of a minute. So they're very good at climbing, even though they can't fly yet. And they'll be with the parents all summer into the fall. And although we don't think of barred owls as being migratory, they do wander in the winter and they sometimes show up in cities. My favorite city sighting was a barred owl that was in the Christmas tree at Faneuil Hall in Boston. And about five o'clock every night, the barred owl would come awake and it would jump high up into the Christmas tree and pull out either a, a cached pigeon or a rat that it had caught. And it would start ripping it apart. And all these people with their shopping bags would be standing there staring at this barred owl, shredding this pigeon. And they were either thrilled to see this or horrified. And that barred owl lived in that tree for two, two, two and a half weeks. And then it moved over to a tree above Mayor Curley, the statue and live there for a few days. And so they do show up in urban areas. And of course, when they do that, the danger is they're gonna pick up a poison mouse or rat because in urban areas, a lot of rodenticides are used. So uh, it's sometimes a, a two-edged sword for the bird. They get lots of food around alleys and dumpsters, a lot of rats and mice. But on the other hand, some of those mice and rats could be tainted. So Marsh is gonna put the barred owl back and we're gonna bring out another owl that is often confused with the barred owl. If you say it fast, it sounds similar. It's the barn owl. Now the barn owl in Massachusetts is pretty rare. In fact, it's on the endangered species list. It's a species of special concern. There's three levels of, uh, of uh, classification for uh, endangered species. is endangered, special concern, and threatened. And so barred, barred owls are common. They're not on that list, but barn owls are species of special concern. There's 30 species of birds in Massachusetts on that list, and 10% of them are owls. The three owls on the list are short-eared owl, long-eared owl, and barn owl. And we're going to show you the barn owl here next. It's one of the most beautiful owls in the world. I think you'll agree. Yet yeah, trying to see one in mass is, is pretty tricky. Um, your best bet is to go to Martha's Vineyard where they nest in fairly good numbers. Uh, but on the mainland, it's a pretty rare owl. Now you can see it looks a lot different than a barred owl. Has dark eyes, but that's about the only similarity. It's got a monkey, a heart-shaped face, and it's a beautiful owl. This is a female. And look at the spots on her and the coloration on her back, the blue grays and the, the tawny coloration. And this owl to me looks like the, the heavens, like you're looking at the stars in the sky. Uh, just this absolutely stunning owl for just beautiful bird. Um, barn owls, like screech owls, don't hoot. They hiss and they screech and they scream. Um, this one, this female, we hear her out there screeching every night. It kind of sounds like rubber tires squealing on pavement. Uh, I'm not going to try to imitate that, mm -hmm. but the hiss we can do, it sounds like and the adults and the young can hiss. Um, this owl probably was more common at one point in Massachusetts before all of our uh, fields and agricultural lands started to revert to forest, which is their natural state. Uh, but back 100 years ago when we were more agricultural, these owls probably were more common, and uh, now they've become quite uncommon. They used to nest on Cape Cod. They're gone from the Cape. They do nest on Nantucket in the vineyard. Um, but to have one in your town would be truly a rare find. Uh, she only weighs a little over a pound. Notice she has long legs. They look longer than the other owls. That's not really the case though. It's just that her feathers are shorter. They have very short plumage and they're not adapted for really cold weather. So you don't find them in cold climates year round. 
Um, the ones in Massachusetts, if we get a harsh winter, can actually suffer uh, some losses as they did on the vineyard several years ago when we had a very harsh winter, 2014. Um, scores of barn owls died because they couldn't find enough food and probably from exposure. But they're rebounding out there, and once again, so they come and go. But they eat a ton of rodents. They eat mostly rats and mice, occasionally small birds. Um, we feed her three or four mice a night, and uh, just a spectacular owl. And the reason we have her is she hatched in captivity. So she's imprinted on people. That is, she's been around people ever since she was a very young bird. So even though she does have a lot of instinct, uh, she probably would not make it in the wild. Yeah. We also have her brother. So we adopted both she and her brother. Uh, they don't live in the same cage. Uh, if we put them together, they would probably breed. And they can have large clutches of eggs. They can have up to 10 or 11 eggs per clutch. And I've even seen records where they've had three clutches in a year. They can also nest any month of the year. It's one of the few owls that can do that. And they tend to nest in old buildings, tree cavities, cliffs or caves, you know, overhangs, overhanging berms on a cliff or in caves, uh, old mine shafts, sometimes in old equipment. One of the weirdest barn owl nests we saw was out on Nantucket. Uh, there was a houseboat anchored out in Nantucket Harbor on, on its mooring and through a broken window in the houseboat, uh, a family of barn owls had, a male and female had gained access and they had laid their eggs in the uh, closet of the master bedroom in the houseboat. And the babies hatched and then the homeowners, the ho boat owners showed up and wanted to use their boat for the summer. And they discovered a family of barn owls in the closet. So they called Edith Andrews and Marsha and myself and we went out to the, uh, the boat and we gently captured the babies and we brought them to shore and we placed them in a birdhouse that we had built especially for this. And the adults followed us to shore and adopted their new home. And I mean, hey, who wouldn't appreciate a new house on the water on Nantucket? I mean, it's hard to find a good birdhouse for less than a million bucks out there. So <laughs> the, the, the transfer went well. The babies all uh, fledged and the homeowners got to use their boat, their houseboat. I think they undoubtedly repaired that window, though. Um, hey, Mark, hey, Mark I'll just, I'll just, I'll just, yes. Can you? I just add. Uh, 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 I can hear can my echo. Does it sound good? <laughs> no. <Nah. laughs> <laughs> so just that the barn and the barn owl have the opposite patterns. The barn owl, as a, as we've seen forest maturation across Massachusetts, has decreased to the point where they're only breeding on the islands now and the barred owl has increased dramatically across the state not and just across the country and across the country and not just for forest maturation but the return of the beaver also plays a big role as barred owls really like wetland forest swampy woods and uh the return of beavers in massachusetts and, and throughout the country and, and canada um has really benefited barred owls it can perhaps worryingly they've taken uh, up residents in the Pacific Northwest in British Columbia, Washington, Oregon, and Northern California, where they're out competing the endangered um, spotted owl. Spotted owl, and it's proving to be a, a management nightmare um, because they were, they're a little bit bigger than spotted owls, and they're a little more aggressive, and they're pushing them out of their their range, and they've disappeared from Northern California and Oregon and Washington, and. Uh, the spotted owls seem to be hanging on in uh, inland and southern locations where there aren't barred owls, but in the northwest, they're really having a hard time. Um, we, got we got one question. Oh, I hear myself twice, too. Um, did you know ahead of time that relocating the barn owl family was likely to succeed? Um, well, there's no guarantees, right? Um, but we had a strong hunch that, you know, the parents are strongly attached to their babies. And we, we figured that they would hear the babies peeping and, you know, making noises and would follow us. And 
it was a nice looking birdhouse that uh, owl house that was built for them. The O'Brien's property. On the O'Brien's property, yeah. And uh, we suspected it would be a good move. I mean, there's no way to guarantee it, but. But the female heard the young and went right into the box. Yeah, I mean, she was on the back on the chicks uh, yeah. in a matter of minutes yeah. as soon as we got ashore. So it really worked out well. Yeah. Great. Thanks. So, Drew, have you seen a barn owl yet in Massachusetts? I have not. Um, yeah. I'm not surprised. I mean, unless you hang out in the vineyard or, the, yeah. or Nantucket, it's hard to find. It's a bird hard to find. Occasionally, you get a stray bird up in Vermont or southern Maine or southern New Hampshire. But there was a pair that nested in Hollis, New Hampshire, which is on the uh, mass border back in the 70s. Uh, but I think that's the last known New Hampshire breeding record. And uh, Vermont used to have them nesting. I think they may be gone from Vermont. But certainly upstate New York, they get them around some of the dairy farms and grasslands that are still there. And they actually are found on six continents. So they're found around the world. And they're, they're a familiar looking owl to an awful lot of people. So a lot of times when people think of owl, they think of the barn owl. Yeah. And her eyes are kind of smaller than other owls, you'll notice, proportional to her body. Um, if this was a male, she'd be a lot whiter. He would be whiter on the underbelly. And the, her brother outside there waiting for his dinner has no spots on his chest and none of that, uh, none of the brown coloration on the upper chest. So they look quite a bit different. And in fact, um, in our travels, we have seen nest boxes put up um, in the Caribbean and in Australia around sugarcane plantations. And uh, barn owls are able to uh, act as rodent control so that the, the farmers don't have to use as much rodenticide. So uh, it I works pretty well. I should have showed this earlier. This is an owl pellet. It's not from a barn owl. Barn owl pellets are invariably black or dark. Um, even if they've eaten a white mouse, their pellet is black. This is from who, Marsha? A great horned. A great horned owl pellet. But um, this is one of the things you can look for um, under a roost. <clears throat> Excuse me. Someone is asking how much uh, she weighs. You might have said that. She weighs about 230, 230 grams. No. No, about 450, sorry. About 450 grams, but about a pound. Yeah, pound. pound I thought she was slightly over a pound, but that yeah. might be uh, depends if she's just eaten or not. If you weigh her when she's just had a mouse or two or three, she she weighs more than when she hasn't. Right. Someone wants to know if your owls have a chance to fly. They do. Oh yeah. Yeah, the cages, the minimum cage sizes are specced by the uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. And our cages are all bigger than minimum size. And so they do have room to fly. All of them do. Some of them, of course, can't fly. So they get handicap ramps and lots of perch options. Uh, the key is to give them choices. And they're much happier if they can, you know, sit in the rain, sit in the sun, sit up high, sit a low, take a bath, sit in the shade. Um, so they all get choices. And sometimes, you know, they want to sit in the open and be seen. Other times they want to kind of hide. So they have places they can kind of sit out of the way and not easily be observed. Right. But we're, we're not open to the public. So w other than going out on programs to schools and groups, they can have their private time and uh, be able to rest. Great. I'm going to ask one other question. And then I think we're going to move on to showing some photos of the other owls. Um, yeah. Someone yeah. wants to know if pellets are regurgitated or pooped. Regurgitated, which means out of the mouth. Yep. Yeah, so whitewash is actually both feces and urine combined into one. So if you look at whitewash, there's a lot of white chalky stuff in it. And that's uric acid. And then if you look at the dark stuff in whitewash, that's the equivalent of feces. And it all comes out of the bird's rear end. So it's not like a mammal, which separates urine and feces. Birds combine it all into one. And then bones and fur and skulls get regurgitated. Perfect. So if you were an owl, you'd be eating your chicken at night, bones and feathers and all. And next morning, you'd be 
hawking up a pellet. <laughs> Thank you so much. This was great. I think we're getting a lot of great comments. Um, Drew, do you want to tell us about some of the other owls that we don't have to show you live, but we're going to show you some photos and then we're going to move on to Q&A after that. So let's great. get this teed up. Yeah, so we're going to try, we're going to cover all the owls that you can regularly find in Massachusetts. Um, so we just have a couple more to go. Thank you, Mark and Marcia, for those live demos. Mm. Those were fantastic. Um, really great to see all those species. One of, uh, another one of my favorites, um, probably second just behind the solid, is this one right here, the, the short-eared owl. Um, this one is one of our uh, species that's listed on our mass endangered species list as, a, as an endangered species. Uh, we used to have it as a nester. We haven't in about 10 years. Um, the, the nesting range had shrunk to the point where it was just on an island off of Nantucket, um, Tucker Nuck Island, and we haven't had a record there in, in many years in terms of nesting. Now they still move down in the winter. So this is a, a, northern, a northern nester. Um, we do get them moving through, they're migrating through about this time. Same as the Solwets, we just don't get nearly as many. Uh, they like large openings, large grassland patches. So if, if you have, and particularly near the coast is where we generally find them. Although sometimes out in the Connecticut Valley, um, you can get them in, in large agricultural grassy open areas. Um, so that's kind of the habitat you're looking for. Last year, there was one on per in, in Parker River that was very obliging. They're out during the day as well. They're, they're both diurnal and nocturnal, so you can go out. If you know where to look, you can go out and find these. Beautiful bird, the, those dark eye markings are particularly striking. Um, they are uncommon, even in the winter. Uh, so yeah, you, you pretty much, you generally are following leads on, on where to go, where they've been seen, but, but they're worth it to try to go out um, and, and try to find one. They're, they're a really spectacular one. All right, next one. Anything to add there, Mark? And Marcia, you can yeah, you can the, add um, anything. I should mention they nest on the ground. <clears throat> yeah. And that's a very dangerous place to nest, particularly on the mainland <clears throat> where you have predators that could uh, eat the eggs or the young. Uh, out on Nantucket, there are no ground predators other than occasionally feral cats. <clears throat> Excuse me, Marsh, you want to talk about that? Yeah, and uh, that's one of the one of the main threats to them. But <clears throat> because they nest on the ground, uh, they're they're exposed to to really any kind of predators. Uh, and um, thankfully, on Nantucket, there aren't many ground predators. And there is the proper habitat for them, which is uh, sand plain grassland and sand plains heathlands. And there's not a lot of those two habitats right. to go around. You find some on Long Island, Block Island, some on the Cape and the islands. Um, and that's historically where you'd find these birds nesting. But those that we've seen up in the Canadian Arctic and the Alaskan Arctic uh, are, are out on the tundra, which is quite similar in some ways to the sampling And grasslands. then in Western U.S., they'll nest in right. grasslands. Right. So they, they are... They do have several different uh, biomes that they'll nest in, habitat types. But it's on the ground. Yeah. Okay. All right. The next one, another state-listed one from Massachusetts, the, the long-eared owl. And, and this is another one that is, is really disappearing from the state as a nesting bird. Um, we haven't had really any records in, in the last few years of, of these guys nesting. They're, they're, they're probably out there in, in very low numbers. Um, again, hard to detect like, like so many of the other owls. These guys are more strictly nocturnal. Um, we do get, similar to short-eared owls, we do get an influx of these guys in the wintertime um, where they come down, they spend the winters here in Massachusetts. Um, they're often found uh, roosting in, in groups uh, in, in cedar trees or conifers of, of, uh, that offer them the cover that they can hide in. So sometimes, sometimes you can find a tree with five, six, seven or, or more uh, long-eared owls in it, um, and, but that's only in, in, in the winter time. A, a striking bird, uh, a really a, a, wonderful, a wonderful species. They, they have an interesting nesting. They don't nest on the, on the ground like the short ear, um, but they don't build their own nest either. They will use old nests of crows um, or, or another species that builds a stick nest. Um, they won't build it themselves, but they'll they'll usurp it or use an old one. Um, so in, in some places, people put out like 
like where we put out artificial cavities for, for species that nest in cavities or a birdhouse, you know, you put out birdhouses for, for species that nest in cavities. Or you can put out baskets uh, for long-eared owls. So that, that's been found to, to work um, in some areas. So that's pretty interesting. Um, so yeah. Drew, one question that we got early on is people were asking for those birds that do nest in boxes. Is there a place that people could go to find plans um, for nest boxes? Oh, What's yeah. the best place to put them up? Yeah, the best place I mean, to look is online. Um, you can find a lot of different plans for the species that you're interested in, whether it be an owl or a songbird. Um, and you can often get guidance on, on where to locate them. Um, if you're having trouble with, with finding those details, you can get in touch with uh, with Mass Wildlife. You can get touch with get in touch with Mass Audubon. Or I could give a few uh, quick tips. Yeah, go, uh, go ahead. Um, doesn't have to be a high box for screech owls. Um, Ten feet is plenty. If you can mount it on a pole, so predators can't climb it, like raccoons, and potentially raid the nest. Um, you want to put up at least two boxes for screech owls because usually squirrels will take over one and you want to clean the box out once a year you don't need to put anything in it um like hay or anything like that you don't want to put hay or grass in there uh if you do feel like you have to put something in it, you can do pine shavings but not cedar shavings and uh face it away from the north don't point the opening of the box to the north where the prevailing wind comes from in the winter and so face it south and face it towards your residence so you can monitor it and when that hole disappears that three and a half to four inch hole disappears that means there's an owl sitting in the hole looking out and depending where you are in massachusetts if you're in western mass your odds of getting screech owls are much lower than if you're in the east or southeastern part of the state uh but if you're on the cape it's a slam dunk you, you you're highly likely to get uh, screech owls nesting or you know in Plymouth and some of the southeast southeastern mass towns um, or towards the coast in Essex County and um, along there there's some prime screech owl habitat mm -hmm. so okay. give it a try put up a couple boxes they're easy to build free plans online uh, scrap pine you can put one together for less than 10 bucks and uh, if you buy them all made they're about 50 bucks so if you're handy you build your own. If you don't want to go near a saw, buy them all made. Great. Drew, did you have more on the long yard or you want me to move on to our next owl? Um, we should probably move on. Okay. Oh, we have one other photo. This is Mark's. <laughs> so how many do you see? How many long yard owls do you see there? Six is easy. <laughs> if you see nine, you're doing really well. This is nine, at least nine, maybe 10 in that picture. Um, if you saw it bigger, it would be obviously easier to see. Now, I can't really point to the picture so you can see where I'm pointing, but um, as I mentioned, six of those owls are in plain view. The other three, not so much. Now, we should mention that this is in Eastern Europe, in Serbia. It's a long-eared owl roost. We actually found a tree over there that had 43 long-eared owls in it. This was not the tree in particular, but... Um, this type, this long eared owl may be split in the future off to another species, uh, but it looks very similar to the North American long eared owl. And this is the type of habitat where they do the communal roosts in the winter. In these, now, unfortunately, they're easily disturbed uh, in this communal roost. So you don't want to approach closely. You want to use binoculars from a distance. And, you know, binoculars are quite handy when you're owl watching because. You can see them up close without getting up close and disturbing them. So I use eight or 10 power binoculars. And then to photograph them, I use telephoto lenses, which magnify the owls without me getting too close. Uh, so if you have a phone that has a camera on it, that's not the camera you want to be using to photograph owls because it means you would get too close to them, flush them, and they all burst out of the roost and burn calories that they can't afford to burn. And so you don't want to be flushing owls. If, if an owl flies when it sees you, you're too close. That's the easy rule of thumb. And if you that's see other people flushing them, say something, you know, speak up. Yep, that's very good advice. I think we even have a point on that in a couple more. Let's see, what else do we have? I know we're 
getting close to eight o'clock, so I want to make sure we get through all all of our owls. Uh, yeah, Drew, what do you think? Only, uh, think yeah, we have two, two more. Left. Yep. So great horned owl. Another one of our, you know, common ones. Distri distribution is across the state. Um, it's yep, a really low, a low call. Sounds like a dove a little bit. Um, the the call does travel for quite some distance. That lower tone uh, travels over over air very well. Um, there are largest of the of the nesting owls. Um, only snowy owl is larger in size that we get, but of course that's not a nester. Um, these guys you know, are, are Drew. Like, um, a lot of people when they hear a morning dove think they're hearing an owl. Yeah, right. So we call the morning dove New England's most commonly heard owl. <laughs> morning doves don't call at night, so that that's your first tip to separate them yeah and horned owls hardly are they're not very active during the day so no and great horned owls eat morning doves if they can <laughs> yeah so so this one's pretty common um one to one to listen for that you know they're, they're in neighborhoods uh, pretty much anywhere you you could you could come across them so learning its call would be well worth your while if trying to identify different owl species in your, in your neighborhood they're in the city too and our last owl is one of our most spectacular too. Um, and this is about a four pound owl. So this is, you know, birds by nature are light in weight. Um, so it's a big owl, even though four pounds doesn't sound like it's so big. Um, this, this is a top predator. Um, we do get them almost every year now, uh, but at, at, with varying numbers. So some years where there's just, uh, you know, a couple dozen or a dozen around other years, um, there might be over a hundred removed just from Logan Airport. So um, I'm not sure what this year has in store. I haven't seen any reports of any around yet, but this I is- So one owl report on eBird the other day and it was in Wisconsin. Oh, and, yeah. This is about the time they start to show up. Um, you know, I, I, I looked northward into Canada and there's no reports of snowy owls up there. So this might be a thin year. Yeah, I was thinking the same. I looked about a week ago and there was hardly anything. Um, but we almost always get a couple and a good place to go is, is, is again, uh, coastal habitats, large grasslands that, that kind of mimic their, their uh, breeding grounds up on the tundra. So Parker River is a good spot. Um, Duxbury Beach, south of Boston is, is a good place. Um, if you're taking off a of Logan, if anybody's flying these days, um, you know, look there as you're taxiing out. Um, that, that's a good place for snowies, although they get removed from there and, and released in, in other places. Um, but, but this bird, you can't mistake it for anything. Quite a dramatic, a dramatic bird and a species that, that Mark has, has put some time into working with. So I'll let him uh, kind of finish this slide up. Well, um, my second book is coming out in the spring. It's about a snowy owl researcher from Massachusetts who now works in the Arctic and Montana, uh, Denver Holt. And so I spent five weeks with Denver Holt two summers ago, photographing snowy owls at the nest, as you see here. This is a female snowy owl with uh, five chicks in the nest. And look at the size disparity between that chick that's going beak to beak with the mother versus that little white bump down in the nest. So when owls lay eggs, they immediately incubate and they lay one egg, they'll incubate it, and then a couple of days later, they lay a second egg and then keep incubating. So the first egg laid will be the first to hatch, and the last egg laid will be the last to hatch, and it could be a week and a half difference in age between the first and last egg, and sometimes these little guys don't make it. The little ones, you know, are, can't compete so great, greatly with the uh, older siblings. Um, so this I took from a blind, this picture. I was about 165 feet away using an 800 millimeter lens. And uh, this was up on the north slope of Alaska. And that's typical nesting site on top of a tundra mound. And this, this scene was shot in late July, if I remember right. It's either the first week of August or the last week of July. And um, female snowy owls are darker than males. Although the owls that we get down here in Massachusetts tend to be first year birds and males and females can be very similar and it can be hard to separate um, when they're here in the state.
but on the on their nesting grounds they're easy to tell apart females have a lot of the dark markings males are almost pure white and it's only the pure white males that usually get to breed uh, dark more darkly marked males usually don't breed until they're older and whiter um, but it was just a great thrill to be able to photograph these birds uh, but they eat a lot of things. Here in Massachusetts, they eat a lot of ducks, a lot of gulls. Norman Smith, who worked uh, at Trailside Museum as the director for many decades, has a picture of a snowy owl at Logan Airport eating another snowy owl. Um, he also has a picture of one taking down a great blue heron uh, and attacking it and then killing it and devouring part of it. So they can take birds down that are heavier than themselves, including geese and uh, herons and and some large ducks like eiders. Uh, they can fly very fast. They can fly more than 60 miles an hour. So they're really an apex predator. Yeah, pretty impressive bird. And before I move on to some tips for how to view owls ethically, someone is very curious to know if we have great gray owls ever in Massachusetts. Mm. Once in yes. a blue moon. Not yeah. very there often. There was one, uh, <laughs> one sighting of a great gray owl. Um, was it three winters ago, I think? 2017. Yeah, 2017. And the birder that found it posted it to eBird and unfortunately misidentified it as a barred owl. And then a week later, someone happened to be perusing the records and they noticed that the barred owl was in fact a great gray owl. So birders piled out there looking for it and at that point they couldn't find it but that same winter um there was a great gray owl that showed up in newport new hampshire which attracted hundreds of people and that owl actually two different days landed on my camera lens so it was not afraid of people whatsoever it was using people's lenses and heads and tripods as a hunting perch and I've got this amazing picture of the owl sitting on a woman's head. Um, and she was thrilled, mostly because she had two hats on. Um, but yeah, these great gray owls, when they do show up, um, the most famous one in Massachusetts was the one in Rowley in 1996. Literally hundreds of people came. It was so crowded on the streets that they had to assign a police detail to that owl. And uh, that bird stayed for three months. And uh, it was an amazing bird to observe. Great gray owls are related to barred owls and they're the same genus, but they're much bigger, although they don't weigh as much as you would expect. The great gray owl might only weigh three pounds, three and a half pounds, uh, although they look huge, but it's mostly feathers. They have very dense, thick plumage, and um, they're a bird of the boreal forest. They're an eruptive uh, bird so they don't come here very often but maine gets them more often than we do and of course maine used to be part of massachusetts so uh but yeah that winter in maine there were others around um but in mass boy we just don't get them very often the nice they thing about the great gray owl is that like the snowy and like the short ear they're active during the day and so when that when, when there is one around um there are often some really good viewing opportunities and as mark said that they, they usually come from places where they've never seen people before so they don't have that natural fear of people and, and that but they use us as perches um <laughs> as they hunt their prey so you know as far as ethics go um that great gray owl that was in newport new hampshire people were really good they didn't try to feed the bird mice which is really a no-no you don't want to habituate the owl to being fed hand fed by humans you know, and God forbid if someone tosses a mouse and the bird flies across a road to get it and gets hit by a car. Um, so it's very bad to have the owl associate humans with food. Um, but the, the group was great up in Newport. I never saw anybody try to feed that owl and the, and the bird was, you know, safe because of that. Um, and people weren't flushing the owl. They were keeping their distance. Mostly people had telephoto lenses um, and binoculars and spotting scopes. And, you know, they weren't playing loud music and they weren't screaming and yelling. So the owl was calm and hunting and you get to observe its true behavior. Mm -hmm. um, so it was a good scene. Um, in fact, when that owl landed on my camera, it previously was sitting on Josh Gahagan's tripod. And I saw the bird staring at me and it flew off Josh's tripod and flew right at me. And I had a 600 millimeter lens out 
with my hand on it and it landed right on my hand on the lens and sat there for about 45 seconds. And then the next day I was back there and the bird sat for 45 minutes on my lens. So just a super trusting bird. Yeah. You never know. <laughs> yeah. And they eat a lot of, a lot of meadow voles down here in Massachusetts uh, and some mice, but mostly voles is what they're eating. Uh, that's their primary food. Drew, did you want to add anything else about about ethics? I know that probably the main concern is, is trying to really watch um, not getting too close, uh, trying to avoid yeah. flushing birds. Is there anything else that you wanted to add? Yeah, the, the, you know, when you're when you're thinking about viewing ethics, you know, it's really the most sensitive times for these birds for owls is, is if, if you have a nesting bird. Um, if you have a bird on a nest, you don't want to be flushing it from the nest. You, know, you don't want to be keeping it off the nest if they have eggs or chicks in there. Um, so you want to keep watching the behavior of the bird. It's okay to find a nest and try to photograph it as long as you're doing it from a distance and you have a nice lens that you could do that safely from or view it with binoculars or a spotting scope. Um, if, if you can do it while, and, and the bird stays on the nest while you're observing it, I'd say you know, you're, you're not bothering it. If you're flushing it off the nest, you're disturbing it. Um, and that could affect it, its breeding outcome. So that could really uh, be the, the, you could cause the result of a failed nesting attempt. And the other time is like what we've alluded to a couple of times already is when the owls are, nest, are roosting in the winter time. So like there's long-eared owls, uh, they have a daytime roost where they're in a pine tree. You really don't want to be flushing them from those areas. Oftentimes, you know, you can get a good view from a distance and view them safely. And again, binoculars, spotting scopes, and uh, camera uh, can, can make that very viewable. Um, but, it, but if you're flushing those birds, whether they're long-eared owls or short-eared owls, um, that's disturbing them. And, and, and during the winter when, when it's cold, they're, they're on an energy budget that's, that's most likely pretty tight. So, you know, repeated flushing of them um, could, could be, could result in that bird going downhill quickly and, and maybe not making it through the winter. Um, same thing with snowy owls that, you know, we get reports sometimes of photographers trying to get that perfect image of a snowy owl. The flight um, shot. They want the flight they shot. They want the flight shot. And so they, they keep flushing those birds. And then, you know, the next day, another photographer, or a couple go out, you know, it happens every day repeatedly that can quickly reduce um, the, the energetic condition of the bird and, and lead to its, its mortality. So th those are big deals. Those are the most sensitive times. Owls are particularly sensitive to it because there are a lot of photographers trying to get that flight shot. Um, yeah, so it's all about, you know, watching the behavior of the bird and using the right equipment. And we talked a little bit about the three species in mass that are rare. Drew, can you tell us a little bit about how people can help rare owls before uh, this will be our last slide and then we'll take a couple questions. I know we're running a few minutes over, but it looks like we still have a good crowd with us. So we'll make sure we get some of your questions before we sign off. Yeah, Thank great. You. And M Mark already mentioned the, the issue with rodenticides. Owls are particularly, all raptors, um, including owls, are particularly sensitive to rodenticides. Um, so rodenticides are anticoagulants. Um, that's how they kill the, um, the rodents. Uh, they, they just, they can't clot. When they when they they internally bleed, so the rodents they don't die right away when they ingest the rodenticides. Rather, they probably leave the structure that they're in and they bumble around outside. Of course, that's perfect pickings for for a raptor looking for prey. That's kind of easy prey items, or or a fox, or a coyote, or a house cat. Um, anything that's out there is going to go for those you know sickened or, or poisoned rodents because they're easy prey, and it doesn't take much. Um, it, it could just be one um, one mouse with rodenticide could could bring down a, a, an owl. So rodenticides are a big deal for, for wildlife. Um, really try to stay away from these things. Don't put them out. As Mark said, snap traps are, are not only more humane um, to, to the to the to the rodent. Um, you know, it kills almost immediately where the rodenticide might take days um, for it to bleed out. Um, but but it's much uh, much more beneficial to to overall wildlife in the area. So rodenticides are a big deal. Um, stay away from them if at all possible. Uh, in terms of our, our rare rare species, especially for nest during the nesting period, so um, late spring through summer, if if you see or hear any of these owls 
Uh, please report them to the Division of Mass Division of Fisheries and Wildlife. Um, we try to keep track of these things. Owls in particular are hard to keep track of. So we rely on those uh, observations coming in from the public to document where these things still exist. Um, you know, monetary donations to wildlife conservation organizations can help rare species. Um, and, and that includes our Natural Heritage and Endangered Species Program. Um, you, you can donate to us through our tax check, through the tax checkoff in the spring um, or, or through the website that you see there um, at any time of year. Yep. Just one quick additional point um, on if you're going to report sightings, it's generally bad form to report a nest location on eBird or MassBird or other of these social media sites. Mm -hmm. So you can be general about it, but don't report specifics for particularly for nesting owls uh, or any nesting raptor for that matter. Because, you know, if you have a crowd of people show up, the bird's going to suffer. So you can report those sorts of things directly to Mass Wildlife um, at that link at the bottom there, that mass.gov slash support NHESP. Uh, from there, you'll see a link where you can report rare species sightings directly to us and also a link to donate to our program. Um, so if you want to know that your, um, you know, your report counts, you can submit it to us there and there's no concerns about, uh, about us uh, if you want to report, especially nesting, that's one of the things that we're most interested in getting um, reports of. So I think we'll have time for a, only a couple of questions because we are running over. Um, one of the questions that we got is asking, this person hunts turkey in the spring and uses a barred owl call for a locator call. And they want to know if they're disrupting their mating habits by doing that. They're disrupting the barred owl mating habits. Um, yeah. Yeah, I wouldn't think so. Um, that barred owl might come in and, and check them out, but uh, should be able to see them pretty quickly and, and recognize that it's not uh, an intruding bird. I haven't heard of that being an issue anyways, of a, of a disrupting barred owl nesting. That's a com commonly used by turkey hunters, yep. um, and, and, and barred owls are, are you know doing increasingly well um, over time across the state. So I don't know, Mark. It doesn't seem like an issue to me. What do you guys think, Mark and Marcia? Well, it's probably not going to be repeated over and over, so it's probably low a low stress thing. Yeah. I don't think it would really hurt the barred owl. Right. Um, I mean, if the turkey hunter did it like all through the day and then the next day and the next day, it might cause some stress. But yeah, once or twice in a hunting session, I don't think it's going to hurt yeah, anything. Just don't keep at it. Yeah. yeah. Less One other. When our next question, what are your thoughts or advice about photographing owls at night using lights? Flash is tough on the owl. So I avoid using flash at night. Um, when I was photographing Drew banding the saw wet owls, I used continuous light. Uh, in other words, light that's not pulsed. So these LED lights now you can get are quite bright. Even a headlamp sometimes is enough to photograph at night. And it, it allows the owl's eyes to adjust much better than with flash, which if you pop a flash while the owl's flying, it's temporarily blinded and it may crash into things. Uh, I've seen reports of that happening. So flash is really not the best thing to use on, on owls particularly. Um, continuous light is okay. Um, headlamps particularly work out. And these new digital cameras are so sensitive they have such good high ISO capabilities that you don't really need a lot of light to photograph them by headlamp. Um, you know, you can still get a decent shutter speed out of the headlamp. Uh, so I'd say headlamps are the way to go. You can even mount the lamp right on your end of your lens. Uh, so, you know, a little LED flashlight that works. I use those, that technique on flammulated owls out in Utah when I was working on my book, uh, Owling. So, yeah, avoid the flash, avoid the rodenticides. Awesome. Um, one question, are there any projects parents can do with their kids to help support owls and their habitats? We talked a little bit about boxes earlier. Is there anything else you guys can think of? You could take apart some pellets. Hmm. Yeah, you can order pellets. If you can't find any, you can order them uh, online. Uh, they're about two bucks a piece. And uh, taking the, you can you know, have a owl pellet dissection birthday party <laughs> uh, um, but 
There's a website, Pellets Inc., Pellets Incorporated. They have good prices. Out on the West Coast. Yeah. And we have it on good authority that they don't disturb owls when they're collecting the pellets. They're all barn owl pellets, and they have barns that they go to to collect these pellets that, where it doesn't disturb the owls. Right. Um, and their prices are about the cheapest we've seen, and yeah. Yeah, it's a good product. Yeah, you, can, you get bone sorting charts to see what kind of – bones you're finding from what animals and also from what part of the body. Yeah, they have great charts. Yeah. All right. We have a lot of questions, but we're not going to be able to get to them all. So we'll do this one last. And um, do owls return to the same nest every year? Maybe this varies by species or... Yeah, I think that's one that's probably going to vary a lot. Most owls probably don't. Like something like the great horned owl, but they're using an older uh, a nest from another species they're not really building the nest but they're they're most likely going to move around from the same territory so they're coming back you know to the same areas but they're, they're most likely using a different specific nest location each year a cavity nester though i would think is much more likely to come back to the same nest because yeah. cavities are so limiting um i've which seen also them gets with the, owls. i've seen them yeah. come back to the same cavity for three years in a row so uh, and then the tree, owls, the tree owls. fell down after that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And and that also goes to the prior question is that yeah, if you want to help owls, if you're if you hear screech owls in your neighborhood, yeah, get a screech owl box up. They will because reuse that year after year. Cavities do tend to be limiting with all our squirrels out there. Um, and just, you know, getting that that uh, additional nest site up could, could be the difference for, for having a screech owl territory in the neighborhood. And leave part of your property, not lawn, just natural habitat. Yeah, let your yeah. let the edges go wild. Because the perfect lawn is like a wildlife desert. Yeah. yeah. That, that's great advice. All right, thank you all so much for joining us tonight. Thank you to our presenters. I think people really enjoyed it. And we hope that everyone has a great and happy Halloween and a great fall. Guys, all right. see you later. Great. Thank you. Thanks for joining. Bye. <laughs>